The Director's Cup honors the most successful program in NCAA sports. The first year it was given to the University of North Carolina, and every other year, 21 years in a row as of 2016, it has been awarded to Stanford. For 40 years in a row, Stanford has won at least one national championship, the longest streak in the nation. Stanford's athletic programs are impressive across the board. Stanford's men's team have always been strong, but what much of what pushes Stanford into Director's Cup contention every year comes from the success of the women's sports teams. Today, Stanford strongly supports women's athletics, but like all schools, it took decades for the support to achieve parity with the men's athletic programs. Cultural expectations for women were very different when Stanford first opened its doors in 1891. Moybridge's studies of animal locomotion from the 1870s present a stark contrast between women and men's physical activity. The woman who reclined while puffing on her cigarette was decidedly less competitive than the men engaged in a bout of fisticuffs. But the long leap from the Victorian period to her own had already begun in the 1890s when the first class of women at Stanford began to play a new sport called basketball. The costume of the Stanford team consisted of a cardinal sweater worn with stays or a belt, brown bloomers, a cardinal polo cap with a dancing tassel, black stockings, and black gymnasium shoes. The game was made more challenging not only by this modest attire, but also by the baskets that had no backboards. Smith, which put together the first team in 1892, practiced indoors for discretion. When they offered to compete intercollegially with Vassar, the president of Smith worried men would watch the game and see the indecency of women in their bloomers, so he put a stop to it. Therefore, the first intercollegiate game was between Cal and Stanford in 1896. They played in the San Francisco Armory, and only women were allowed to watch. The game was reviewed in this way. There was nothing easy or feminine about the game. There were many falls when three girls or more went down with a crash, some fine exhibitions of high jump, and great speed and endurance shown. Although Stanford beat Cal 2-1 to one and subsequent games were well attended by women, within two years Jane Stanford decided that intercollegiate competition was too physically dangerous for women. Even 20 years later, a story about an altercation at a game in 1898 was cited as the reason for the prohibition, but the reasons were far more complex. The first woman director of physical training and hygiene at Stanford, Clelia Mosier, tried to teach her students not to be limited by their sex. Their textbook taught that much of what we lightly class as masculinity and femininity is not congenital, but is reacquired from generation to generation. Nonetheless, they were handicapped by prevailing medical opinions about female fragility and societal mores, which made it difficult to find appropriate attire, funding, and facilities to compete in sports or even practice. For decades, only interclass competition and a yearly triangular play day involving Mills, Cal, and Stanford were permitted, and only in those sports deemed fit for women – gymnastics, dance, some lacrosse, and tennis. Fencing competitions began in 1915, and funds for a modern pool encouraged women to swim in 1916. Archery was inaugurated officially in 1920, and the Women's Athletic Association began hosting an official field day for track and field, then called racing, in 1923. Although the Women's Athletic Association continued to lobby for women's athletics, a mixture of underfunding and passive obstruction slowed progress. In the 1930s, a few Olympians came from Stanford's intramural track and field and diving, but progress was slow until the late 60s. In 1967, Karen Switzer, who was not from Stanford, registered for the Boston Marathon using only her initials to gain entry. When an official noticed a woman was running, he would have ripped the number off her shirt had Switzer's boyfriend, not football, blocked him out of the way. By 1972, a posse of women ran the marathon. Similar gains were made by Stanford's own Billie Jean King, who became a tennis champion and symbol of the women's movement in the early 70s. I think people misinterpret the women's movement in that they feel that women want to dominate. But I think really, at least in my heart and mind, it's to help create equal opportunity as well as, as to share, not dominate. It's a big difference in those two words. Through all eight of the first decades of women's sports at Stanford, it was clear that women wanted to play basketball. Over 50 players signed up to play in 1916, more than at any other time in the history of the sport. 
But by as late as the 1960s, still no Stanford team was permitted to compete intercollegiately. In retrospect, it is painfully obvious how women were held back more by cultural expectations than by the science of women's physiology or women's experience in the sport. Even after Title IX forbid discrimination in 1972, it would take three years for there to be a varsity team and almost two decades for the women's basketball team to fill Maple Stadium, win a national championship, and receive the support it deserved. What follows is from the film titled In the Game by Becky Smith about the 1990 women's championship basketball season. It was a challenge of having people really be students and, you know, for women recognizing that you're not going to go on to the NBA, so your education is really important. Coach Vandeveer describes her own pain at not having the opportunity to play the game she loved as a young athlete. It was really frustrating not to have the experiences that the boys had. We had no coaching. I think that in a lot of respects, sports is one of the last bastions of um, a lot of male chauvinism and, and sexism, and it's you know, when you're young and you're growing up, you don't understand those things. It's just very painful. As they started to win and fill Maple's Pavilion, university officials began to take the sport more seriously, and fans began to realize that maybe their daughters could play too. I smile when I when I think about the reaction of boosters to women's athletics. I've had so many men uh, oppose women's athletics until their daughters become 15, and all of a sudden they say, "Wow, this is pretty terrific!" And you mean she might be able to get a scholarship too? Basketball wasn't the first national title for Stanford. Several women won individual national titles in the 1960s, but the first Stanford women's team championship came in 1978 for tennis. From then on, the women's national championships started to accumulate. Swimming and diving, basketball, volleyball, cross country, synchronized swimming, water polo, rowing, soccer, golf. In part, these successes resulted from a better understanding that female athletes can train as hard as men, but strong coaching and better resources also helped them reach their potential. In the 1890s, the only gym for women was Robley, and it was considered unseemly for women to practice sports outdoors. Today, women share with men over a million gross feet of indoor facilities and 94 acres of outdoor fields. As you can see beside me, currently Stanford has strong parity in men and women's sports. Further, Stanford is renowned for its high standards in recruiting scholar athletes. As an example, Stanford athletes have the highest number of NCAA scholarships and one of the overall highest graduation success rates in the country, 98%. I've experienced this firsthand in my on-campus classes where all of the students, including the athletes, impress me with their academic rigor, work ethic, and enthusiasm. The fun thing is that by taking this class, you still are one of those students. Congratulations. Stanford is very proud of its bookish reputation, and we all embrace the Nerd Nation moniker wholeheartedly. In case you haven't seen it, I've linked the Nerd Nation rap video in the next module of this bonus section, so have a look. You may even catch a glimpse of our outgoing president getting in on the action. Check it out, and then you'll see me again in the following module talking about gender differences in sports performance, what's cultural and what's physiologic. See you soon.